Uh, let's get started here. First things first, like I said, we're still giving away books. If anyone on the internet who watches this video and wants a free book, we've got two we're giving away. Jesus wasn't talking to you and things that I've been taught from the Bible that are not true. If you want one or both of those, we just need a mailing address and we'll send that out to you. This week we're going to continue with the Ambassadors Training Camp series. Uh, talking about simple, foundational, fundamental things that we all need to know. And the purpose of this is we want to be able to train the newbies, the up-and-comers, children, like my children, who I hope are paying attention for the next little bit. And, you know, every time I do a series like this, I know that people here, people on the Internet, the, the thought may be, well, why are we wasting time on this? I already know all this stuff. Well, likely you don't know all this stuff, one. And two, it's to equip you to teach people yourself. Amen. Do you know how to teach a newbie? A lot of people go, oh, I never thought about it that way. You know, like you were talking about with the people you're interacting with. You need to know how to teach people how to learn. So where we're at, in part three we talked about, this is part four, in part three we talked about some necessary things you need to think about and decide when you're coming to approach God's Word on your own and study it on your own for the first time in your life. Because most people don't. But the first requirement was you need to know how to read. And everybody laughs, but we looked at the studies and the statistics where 26 million people in our country, adult people, do not know how to read. So, and we looked at Ephesians 3, 4, where it says, whereby when ye read, that's how you get understanding. When ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And the one thing I don't think I hit on, but... We're not just talking about mindless reading. You know, you know what it's like when you go, I'm going to read through the Bible in a year. It's, there's somebody in this group, you know, always saying something about read. Really read? Is he oh. in here anywhere? But that's what we need to do. We need to read with understanding. A, a, a perfect example would be a lot of people have trouble with the book of Romans because it's so heavy in doctrine and talks about so many different things, but you want to understand Romans, read the first five chapters about five or ten times, Amen. over and over and over again. And then when you've read it over and over, you, what you start to do is you start to see the forest rather than the trees. Verses that were troublesome to you your first time through, now you get them because you've read it over and over and over again. And you see, well, I see what Paul's doing here. It's like the first few chapters, he's going through a history lesson from the beginning of the world all the way up until now, condemning everyone under sin. And then he talks about how grace came in and what Christ accomplished and the new man versus the old. And suddenly it starts to make sense. But it's repetition, 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 reading. The other thing we talked about last time is don't turn your personal Bible study into book about the Bible study, which is what we all do. We get a book about the Bible. We get commentaries. We talked about going to the commentaries last because commentators are the ones who write commentaries, and commentators all have their own personal bias and personal slant. And we're talking about you doing your personal Bible study. And then finally, we talked about proof texting. Um, proof texting is deciding what you want or believe about the Bible in advance and then going to the Bible to try to find support for what you've already decided in your own personal bias. We don't ever want to be proof texters. So as we move on this week, we're, talk we're now to the position, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to try to study the Bible for myself for the first time in my life. And that's where we're going to start. And I do want to reveal a dirty little secret 
to you grace people here. Are you ready? Everybody, can we, can we all quote from memory 2 Timothy 2.15? Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And everybody says, Amen and Yay! I'll tell you something about people who say Amen and Yay. The dirty little secret is, <laughs> what did I miss? Amen. <laughs> oh, okay. Here's a secret I'm going to let you in on. I've been doing this a while now. The people who say, yep, 2 Timothy 2.15, that's our marching orders, guess what? They are not studying to show themselves approved. The vast majority of them, if somebody's going to watch this on YouTube and their cheeks just turned red because they know I just called them out. The vast majority of people who say, I study to show myself approved unto God, do not do it. Or if they do, maybe a five minutes a month or something like that. What they do do is they watch guys like me talk about my study on YouTube. Or they listen to MP3s, or they, they listen to podcasts, or they read articles from people like me. But the vast majority of them do not study on their own. And this is grace people. We're supposed to be the most studious of the studious. But I can tell you, I have gigabytes of proof that they are not studying. I have a vast email archive of people who have sent in questions or sent emails to me. And I can tell you, the vast majority of grace people are not actually studying the Bible for themselves. They pick a teacher they like, or pitch a, pick a camp they like, or some guys are on TV, they pick a team, and they just watch them and listen to them and go, okay, and call that Bible study. That is not personal Bible study. And here's how I know. I read the question in the email, and I realize it's going to take me longer to type out the answer than to think about what the answer is. <laughs> And I know if they were studying for themselves, if they knew how, they would have never sent that email question to me because they would have known how to find the answer. And I'm not talking, I know there's probably somebody that's a newbie that's getting offended. I'm not talking about the newbies. I'm talking about the people who should know better, who've been around and who should know how to study for themselves. But for us, if we are going to be students or if up and coming children are going to take some responsibility for their faith at a point in their life and study for themselves after we learn how to read, after we know not to proof text, after we know not to go to the commentators first. If we're going to take ownership of our life of service as ambassadors, study ourselves, we need to get familiar with the language of the book. Because the language of this book is not the same language that we all speak with on a daily basis, to a large degree. We're much more dumbed down in our language. So you need to get familiar with the words. And I can hear off in YouTube land, in the internet world, I can hear it now. Somebody's going, Wah! I don't want to! The Bible's hard! The King Jimmy, oh my goodness! I can't do it. I can't understand it. I can hear it right now. I've got a 10-year-old boy at home that can read this. He's not a genius either. He's a normal 10-year-old boy. I'm glad his mom's not here right now. <laughs> you can do it. If I can quote the great theologian, you know, no, I always quote the greatest theologians. The great theologian Barack Obama. <laughs> yes, we can. We can do it. We can get familiar with the language of the book. Think about Oh yeah, Barack Obama, he's dispensation. He's great. <laughs> I just thought of something. 
We went in less than, less than four years, we went from yes, we can, to come on, man. <laughs> Isn't that what Biden's saying? Come on, man. Anyway, hopefully on Tuesday all this will be over. But learning a new lexicon, that's what we're talking about. Learning a new lexicon, we're very familiar, all of us are familiar with this. Every time we've gotten a new job, worked at a new company, they have their own lexicon. Different industries, they have their own sub-language that you have to learn. It's the same thing when we come to our Bible. We have to learn the way the Bible uses words. Think about it. Every hobby, every sport you ever play, they have their own language in the sport. You hear them calling out things on the field, what does that even mean? I don't know. But if you knew the sport and you knew the language, you'd understand it. I had to learn a new language when I was learning how to be a pilot. Well, think about this. If I walk up here and say, let me do my pilot voice. <laughs> you know they all have a voice. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for <laughs> If I come up there and say, Charlie Alpha Kilo Ground, Skyhawk 373 has information X-ray. Looking to depart VFR at or below 3,000 to Bravo, Juliet, Juliet. What in the world am I talking about? That makes no sense at church. He wants to go west with 3,000 Juliets? I, I don't What? But over at the airport, that makes absolutely perfectly clear sense. It's learning the lexicon. That's what we're talking about. And that's the thing that's frustrating about us Bible students or people that want to be Bible students is we'll learn a new lexicon for a job. We'll learn a new lexicon for a sport. But when it comes to eternity, when it comes to service for our Savior, we don't want to be bothered with it. So we'll learn hard words, new lexicons for cash, but not for service to Christ. Suddenly the people that were making excuses, their excuses don't sound too good right now. <laughs> Sorry, I meant to ruin it for you. But, so when we're coming to study the Bible for ourselves, personal, Bible study. We have tools at our disposal. My one daughter says she has a thirst for knowledge, an insatiable thirst. So when it comes to learning your Bible, these are some tools you can have to satisfy your thirst. First of all, the King James Bible is the one that's always attacked because, you know, that's the one that's way too hard. Get anything other than a King James is what's told to people. There are, if you take out all the names, you know, Mephibosheth, Peter, Zebedee, all those, if you take out the names, there are 8,000 different words in the King James Bible. Why is that relevant? The average six-year-old has an 8,000-word vocabulary. The average six-year-old, you know, their words may not be <laughs> four-syllable words, but the average six-year-old knows about 8,000 words. That's how many different words are in our King James Bible. So it's doable. Yes, we can, says Barack Obama. Now think about it. People can learn to quote Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me, except learn how to read my Bible. <laughs> except how to study His Word. We can do it. And let's just get the, the biggest one out of the way. I want me a Bible what don't got no these and thous in it. Right. We learn, that's not hard to teach people, that thee and thou are actually helpful. Because anytime I see a thee 
or a thou, I know I'm talking to one person. Anytime I see a ye or a you, I could be talking to two people or I could be talking to all y'all. It's plural. So that's helpful. But we're coming to our Bible here. You're, you're finally, I'm taking ownership. I'm going to study it myself. And you come and you get tripped up by a hard word. I, don't, I have never even heard this word, much less know what it means. We have dictionaries. Did you know that? You don't even have to buy a dictionary anymore. If you have internet access, you can pull up any dictionary you want like that. I remember back in my day, we had to buy books. <laughs> Had to drive to a store. <laughs> but, you know, I bought the Webster's 1828. That thing's, what, six inches thick? It's, that could be a murder weapon, that thing's so big. <laughs> now, it's free on the internet. You just open a tab and there it is. So you don't even have to buy a dictionary anymore. So excuses for not doing it yourself keep dropping away. But, so, I mean, a good dictionary, a good exhaustive dictionary, has about 400,000 words in it. And you only need help with 8,000. A handful of 8,000, really. You know what the is? You know what a and? You can handle that. Here's an example. If you would please turn over to Job, chapter 16. So, it is COVID 2020. And there you are, you've decided it's COVID 2020, I'm going to study the book of Job. Because <laughs> I'm having a rough year. And I heard that Job guy had a rough year. Job chapter 16 and verse 6. After I'm done with Job, there's one in there called Lamentations. I think that's next finish out 2020 on Lamentations. So here you are, you're reading Job 16, and he says, Though I speak, my grief is not assuaged. What in the world is that word? Though I speak, my grief is not assuaged, and though I forbear, what am I eased? <laughs> What's my commentary say? Ah, stop it! Don't go to the commentaries first. Get a dictionary out. But just step back and look at the verse and read it again. You kind of get an idea what that word means just from the context. Because it looks like he's saying something twice. Though I speak, my grief is not assuaged. And though I forbear, what am I eased? Could assuaged be some kind of a synonym for eased? So here you are. You haven't even cracked the dictionary yet. You haven't done anything. You just read it twice, and you're starting to get an idea of what this hard word means. But the other thing that you have now that's free on the Internet, no one in the history of this planet has the power we have at our fingertips right now. You can actually find anywhere in the Bible, any place any word exists in the Bible for free at the snap of a finger. That's through a concordance. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Let me put dictionary on the board. But assuaged is kind of a funny word. I bet all of us went through our entire week this week and none of us used that word. No? No one? Sure? Okay. So there is one other place in the Bible where this word appears. That's back in Genesis. Genesis chapter 8. That's to the left for the newbies. Genesis chapter 8 and verse 1. 
So this word, it's a hard word. We don't really know what it means. It only happens twice in the Bible. We used an online concordance, found the other place. Look at this. And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. And this is where you have the light bulb moment. Again, no commentators are out, no YouTube, no articles. This is just you and your Bible. You got stumbled over a hard word, and you say, wait a minute, I learned about this in Sunday school. Why, what happened is Noah got in the boat with Joan of Arc, his wife. <laughs> Noah and Joan of Arc got in the boat. And then the rain started, and the water went up, 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 and everybody died, but they didn't talk about that in Sunday school. And then later, the water went down, 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 down. So I just read, could assuaged have something to do with coming down or backing off? Again, you're just getting it from the context of the verses. You're just reading the verses. Well, wait, didn't Job say that after he used the words dissuade? He said, what am I eased? Backing off? So what you've done now, you haven't opened a dictionary yet, but the best dictionary of the Bible is the Bible defining its own terms. Have I ever said that before? Probably a hundred times. The Bible defining its own terms. Now that you've looked at it for yourself in the Bible, you got a pretty good idea. Now pop out the dictionary. And again, it's free on the internet. You don't have to spend 35 bucks like I did. And then I lost it. That's why you hate moving. Every time you move, you lose stuff. But you open free on the internet, and you see in your Webster's 1828 that assuaged means to mitigate or ease or appease. So it agrees exactly with the context you saw in the Bible. Now you've learned a new word. You've got one that won't trip you up anymore as you come through in your Bible study, you're smarter and you still have a Bible and you still haven't outsourced your own personal Bible study to other people. That's a good place to be in, isn't it? But Bible study, as we move on here, the next tool is a good concordance. You don't have to buy one anymore either. That's another one I had to buy, another big thick. What was the Strong's? That was probably five inches thick. Also could be used as a murder weapon. <laughs> Takes up a lot of space in the bookshelf. But what is a concordance for the newbies, for children who may not know what a concordance is? Do you know what a concordance is? Iffy, okay. Well, I'll get you 100%. Alphabetical list of every word in the Bible and every verse in which it appears. How'd you like to be the guy that had that job? Some, some people like tedious activity. <laughs> I would go and say, but every word in the Bible in alphabetical order with every verse where it appears. You now have that at your fingertips with a couple of mouse clicks. And there are thousands of years of human history looking forward at us going, why aren't you idiots studying more? <laughs> it's so easy. We used to have to find the scrolls and roll them all out. But like everything else, it's free on the internet. So Bible study is word study. And you can use a concordance to do your own word study of throughout the whole Bible. Do it yourself. Let's use an example. If you would, please turn over to Exodus 14.
What's the main thing that concerns most of us that we would want to study? How about the salvation of your never dying soul? Okay, let's talk about salvation. So you can use a concordance to do a word study of salvation. And get every reference to every verse in the Bible where that appears. And then you can go on to other words like saved or that kind of thing. But let's just use the term salvation. Exodus 14 in chapter 13. What did I say? Listen to what I meant, not what I said. <laughs> Exodus chapter 14, verse 13. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. There's the term, salvation. Which will sh he will show to you this day. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. <laughs> if we're talking about salvation in this passage, what are they being saved from? Is he talking about salvation by grace through faith for your eternal No. He's saying, I'm going to kill that Egyptian army for you. You'll see them no more. I'm gonna so they're being saved from, in that term, death, dismemberment. They're being saved from being killed. So what have I learned now in my personal Bible study? And again, I know this is simple, but a lot of folks don't get this. I'm studying my Bible, and I've learned now that the term salvation can refer to me not getting killed that day. It has nothing to do with my soul. It has to do with my skin. I will keep my head attached to my neck all day today and into tomorrow. That's what the term salvation can be talking about. Again, no commentators are, have been brought out. No preachers have brought in the room. This is you looking at your Bible, reading with understanding, reading with your brain turned on, thinking about these verses. Let's move on. How about Isaiah chapter 45, verse 17? Did I say it right that time? Okay. When we look at it. <laughs> Isaiah chapter forty five and verse seventeen. And Isaiah 45, 17 says, But Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed, nor confounded world without end. That sounds like a forever thing, doesn't it? Now, if I'm just getting my skin saved in Exodus, I'm still going to die one day. But this talking about everlasting, that's forever. So it seems that verse is talking likely about salvation of a soul, isn't it? Okay. But that verse is about us, right? Well, wait, it says Israel there, doesn't it? And it's talking about a future salvation out in the future. Didn't we get that from reading the verse? Shall be, that means not here yet. So we've learned a couple of things there that, because if you're saved, if you're studying your Bible, 
as a Bible student and you actually know the gospel, you know you have salvation now, like Clarence was talking about. You've got it now. This verse is talking about Israel out in the future. So now you have a salvation that's about a soul. And what is that verse doing? It's telling the future before the future happens. Do you know what that's called? Prophecy. prophecy. And we know that we are part of the mystery, not prophecy. So you're learning things as you're going through. Let's turn now to the book of Romans, chapter 1. This is something that a 13-year-old can do. This is something that a 14-year-old can do on their own as they go through their Bible, read it, thinking. This is a verse I'm sure you're all familiar with. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Is he talking about being saved from an Egyptian army there? No. It's pretty plain. It's pretty clear. He's talking about your soul being saved. Because we know what the gospel of Christ is from this same writer, don't we? We know it's what Christ did, his death, his burial, his resurrection. So definitely there we see that salvation now, this is the second verse we've come to, that's talking about a soul's salvation. Now let's make it a little bit more difficult. 2 Corinthians 1, please. Same writer. He used the term salvation in talking about a soul salvation. Now we're going to see it again by the same apostle. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 5. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, eh? which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we be comforted, it is your, for your consolation and salvation. Huh? Are we saved by the sufferings of Paul? Is our soul saved by the sufferings of Paul? Not the last I heard. So, it's the same guy, too, by the way. Same writer. So, he couldn't be talking about how a soul is saved in this verse, could he? Unless he was having a senior moment. No. So, what are people being saved from there? In the context of the verse, if you read it, really read it, what you're being saved from there is physical trouble that's essentially what he's saying better me than you Paul's suffering you guys heard about it better me than you and then at the end of the verse he's, the people are being saved from worry or fear So here you are, the Bible student. You've just gone through a few verses here on your own, using free on the internet tools, and you've learned some things about the word salvation in your Bible. It doesn't always mean talking about your soul. It could be talking about being saved from quite a few things. So you know that now. You've learned from the context. Why does that matter? I'm going to give you an example. The first thing it does is it helps protect you from Bible confusion. It protects you from false teachers teaching wrong doctrine. Because you've learned some things on your own now. You've got a little bit of armor to fight off error. It makes you, it also, you doing this yourself protects you 
from proof texting or proof texters, of which abound. <laughs> but it also equips you to not have to send me an email. It, <laughs> it equips you to find the answers for yourself. I, and I'm not mad at anybody. I used to be the emailer. Okay? And then one guy that I emailed more than anybody, I hadn't sent him an email in a long time, and I sent him an email, and he said, I wondered if you were still out there. <laughs> yeah, I just kind of sorted out how to get the answers on my own now. But the, the best thing it does, you learning to use these simple free tools, spending some time and spending some brain power on this, is it teaches you to study to show yourself approved unto God. The bumper sticker verse. Those of you who are adults in here, you know what I'm talking about when you come to a place in your life in a position where I have ownership. I am equipped to handle this myself. I don't need help from other people. I can do this. I am in charge of this household because I said so. <laughs> that, there's, there's a peace and a joy of knowing your position and knowing you have an ability to do something. That's what we're talking about, getting from newbie, from green to established. You can study and know these things yourself. Now, I use the word salvation. And I talked about proof texting. And I'm going to give you an example that you're not going to believe, but believe it. Oh, brother, I got to tell you, my wife, she's as unsaved as can be. She hates Jesus. She says the Bible's a dumb fairy tale. She cusses like an American politician. <laughs> Can't say sailor anymore. You got to say American politician. But brother, I got great news. My preacher told me how to get her saved. And I'm going to go home right now and I'm going to start, you know, while, you're, while I'm doing this analogy, turn over to 1 Timothy 2.15. Brother, my preacher told me a surefire way to get her saved. And I'm going to go home right now and nine months from now she's going to be as saved as anybody. Because I, my preacher showed me 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. And it says, notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing. <laughs> so nine months from today, brother, my Jesus-hating <laughs> wife, she's going to be saved whether she likes it or not. Because when we get to the hospital, it's going to save the world. <laughs> You think I'm telling a joke. <laughs> this has happened to real people in the real world. You want to talk about proof? I mean, whatever you make of that verse, if you've done a little bit of study on the word salvation or saved, you know he's not talking about getting a soul saved through having a baby. It happens. And that's, you know, that's a funny example of proof texting, but what about if it's a more dangerous thing? What if it's about something that can cause somebody to believe something that keeps them unsafe? All right, moving on. I better hurry up. We, did, we talked about word study. Bible study is word study. We use the term salvation. What if... We did a study on the word, what if we had come across, we're reading the Bible and we see the word mystery? Ooh, I like mysteries. What happens if we do a word study on the word mystery in our Bible? With our free concordance on the internet, we find out in two thousandths of one second that the word mystery occurs 22 times in the entire Bible. 22 times, seventeen of the twenty-two times the word mystery is being spoken by that guy. 
So that leaves 5. He wrote about 5% of the Bible. So 5 times in 95% of the Bible versus 17 times in 5% of the Bible. What's that going to do to you? If that you're just on your own trying to study? That's going to say, what in the world is this mystery Paul is talking about? He's using the word mystery so many times. And obviously, you don't know much. You're just trying to learn on your own. You don't know there's real six major aspects to the mystery of Christ. You don't know what that means compared to the rest of your Bible yet. You don't even know yet what your life in Christ should look like necessarily, or that Christ revealed a special message to Paul. You don't know any of that. But all you know is, that guy's talking about a mystery a lot. Maybe I should look into that. A lot of, all of us would have gotten here a lot faster <laughs> if we would have done that, wouldn't we? What is this mystery that Paul was talking about? 77% of the uses of the word mystery are by Paul. Maybe there's something here. Maybe I need to study this further. And what have you stumbled into now? Grace. You've stumbled into the key to unlocking your Bible to you and making you understand all by using a free online tool. Wow. How many more people would be here if more people were taught to do personal Bible study? At least five. <laughs> Simple tools, though. All right. Uh, we'll finish up with this. I'll have to hurry. Another way we can use a concordance, and I've got a messy board here. Let me clean that up. Bible study is word study. We saw the example of the word salvation. Did you know you can study phrases in your Bible? On your concordance, if you type in the concordance a quotation mark, and for our example, we'll just put day of the Lord. If you put it in quotations, your concordance, your online concordance, will search your Bible for everywhere in your Bible that phrase is exactly as it's written in those quotations. You were reading the Bible through in a year and you saw that day of the Lord show up a lot and you decide, I'm going to go back and figure out what that's all about, study that further. So you come up with an example, Day of the Lord. And you run into Isaiah 12, 6, and I'll just read these to you for time's sake. Howl ye. Howl. I don't want to be howling. Howl ye. I know what ye means because I learned that. It's talking to lots of people, more than one person. Howl ye. The day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. That's worse than coronavirus. What have you learned? Destruction. Who's the destroyer? You know, they used to say if you absolutely positively need something destroyed by morning, call the Marines. I think God Almighty is a little bit better at destroying things, isn't he? Day of the Lord, I've learned it has to do with destruction of the Almighty. Then on Isaiah 13, 9, you see, behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. This is not happy, happy, joy, joy day, is it? Wrath. Anger. That's the opposite of Romans 5.1. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. How would you like to be on the other end of that? God's angry at you and has wrath coming your way. You move along to Jeremiah. 
Jeremiah 46.10, For this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, that he may avenge him of his adversaries, and the sword shall devour, and he shall be satiate and made drunk with their blood. Whoa. Blood, death. What are we learning about the day of the Lord by ourselves here? I don't want to attend. <laughs> Scary. Joel chapter 2 verse 31, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Whoa. Guess how many times that's happened in history? Zero. So now we have something going on in the heavens, sun and the moon, dark. Finally, in Zephaniah, you can find that if you look for the fresh gold on the side of your Bible. <laughs> it's never been touched. <laughs> Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 14. The great day of the Lord is near, it is near, and hasteth greatly. Even the voice of the day of the Lord, the mighty man shall cry there bitterly. So you've learned some things about the day of the Lord. You've become a little bit thankful for grace. You've been... You're thankful for who God has made you in Christ Jesus. You know that the day of the Lord is not a happy, joy, joy, time, time. It looks like it's very apocalyptic. It looks like it's the end of the world, destroying enemies and ushering in a kingdom, if you read the context of all these verses. That, how will that help you? What will that protect you from? How about when your preacher starts his series on Revelation? That usually happens in the summertime because attendance goes down and they bring in the apocalypse to kind of get exciting and get more people to come. But your preacher takes you over to the book of Revelation. And in chapter 1, he tells you John was at church on Sunday getting ready to go to the fried chicken house when he got Revelation. You didn't know that? Revelation chapter 1, verses 9. Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. You'll understand in a second. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of the Lord and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. How, let's, I don't want to see a show of hands, but I bet you every one of us in here think the Lord's Day means Sunday go to meeting at church. Don't we? That's what we were all told. The Lord's Day is Sunday. Well, I've read some things about the Lord's Day in the Bible. And it's not Sunday go to meeting before we get to fried chicken. What have I learned about the day of the Lord in my phrase study on my own without the help of a preacher or a commentator? I've learned that the day of the Lord kind of matches everything in there in Revelation. Interesting. Knowing these Bible things, doing the work on your own can protect you from wrongly combining the word of truth. Because how many of us we're raised up and taught in pulpits that revelation is all about us. It's not. We know that what the day of the Lord is from running the references, and we can look at it and say, I, John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. I think he's talking about the day of the Lord that I read all about on my own. But furthermore, 
You've done the word study on the word mystery already before somebody lied to you and told you Revelation was all about the church. And you've learned from your word study on the mystery, the gospel that saves you, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, Romans 16, 25. You know your standing in Christ is secure, Ephesians 1, 7 through 9. You know you're not trying to endure to the end of anything. You know what your mission is while you're here, Colossians 1, 27. You're an ambassador. And you know your eternal destination in Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 31, is not Israel's kingdom on earth. You know you're going to heavenly places. Amen. So, no matter how charismatic the preacher, no matter how big the following, you know, I don't think this guy's got it right. John's not talking about finishing up church on Sunday and then going out and getting a vision before he got to the fried chicken house. I don't know if they had fried chicken on Patmos, but... <laughs> you get my meaning, though. Do you understand how much wrong doctrine you've been protected from just by doing a simple phrase study on your own? I mean, Revelation is where cults are built, aren't they? David Koresh and the Branch Davidians, it was all built on he had the key to Revelation. But you... Knowing, yeah, this is Bible, but this is not my direct doctrine because it doesn't match all the other stuff I studied. It matches all the prophecies for Israel. And I've learned from my own simple word studies that prophecy is different than mystery because they're opposite words. So I know whoever is in this book, it can't be me because I'm saved according to the mystery. How many people have sold their homes, given all the money from their paid-for homes to the preacher because he said the rapture was going to happen next Tuesday? Millions and millions. How many thousands of life savings squandered and destroyed? How many lives ruined because people didn't study for themselves and felt prey to a bad teacher? That's not you if you take ownership and do it yourself. How did you get there? I decided to spend some time on it and I used free tools on the internet. If you don't have internet, you'll have to buy the book. It's 30 bucks, you can do it. But better than that, what have you done for your Savior, for the God who loved you enough to save you. Oh, you've done the bumper sticker verse, 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself. Hey, wait a minute. I learned from the these and the thous that thy means me by myself. Study to show thyself approved. That means watching Steve on a YouTube video is not studying thyself. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Don't you want to have that testimony when you're standing there, thyself, at the judgment seat of Christ? I did the work. I did what I was told to do myself. I did my best for you, Lord. I want to have that testimony. Judgment seat of Christ, the results of that are eternal, aren't they? No going back. I kind of made a bad decision. Can you put me back and I'll try better? Nope. You can do it. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Whether you're 70 or whether you're 12, you can learn this book. You can understand it. You can learn the language. And why do I say that over and over and over and over again? If you've watched me for any length of time, you know that I walked out of church at age 16 not a great IQ, but not a dummy. And the one thing I knew was I would never be able to understand my Bible. <coughs> not unless I went out and got four PhDs. I was wrong. You can do it. If I can do it, you can do it. Anybody can do it. Yes, we can. <laughs> all right, that is all I have for this week.